I challenge everybody listening, try that for a day and see how much different you feel at the end of that day. You are listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness, your number one resource for practical tips and insights, empowering you and your family to live well with Alzheimer's. Hello, I'm Mike Good of Togetherness. Welcome to episode 50 of The Alzheimer's Podcast, your number one source for practical tips and insights. My goal is always to empower you to maintain a positive experience, reduce and eliminate the need for medications, and make your time together with those you care for the best it can be. For the last couple of episodes, Christy Turner and I have been discussing how to bring the various aspects of memory care into your home. Our hope is to help you delay or completely avoid the need to move your loved one into a professional memory care community by guiding you through the process of making your home what I refer to as dementia friendly. However, it's going to take a lot of planning and hard work, but if it's what you want, you can do it. In this episode, we continue discussing actionable things you can do to make your home dementia friendly. This is based on my signature course, Adapting Your Home for Dementia, where I teach students how to adapt and manage four elements of the home. These include safety, function, stimulation, and eliminating triggers which result in negative outcomes. In today's episode, Christy and I will discuss stimulation and keeping your loved one active. Stimulation will help keep your loved one mentally and physically active, bring joy, lift their spirit, and result in feelings of purpose and accomplishment. And it helps keep the body healthy by delivering nutrients and oxygen-rich blood throughout the body. This would help you keep them home longer, safer, and happier, and you will personally feel the benefit to your physical and emotional health. Well, hi, Christy. I'm looking forward to our conversation today on ways to keep your loved one active and stimulated when caring for them at home. This is such an important topic. I'm so happy we're talking about it. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the more complicated topics too because when I look at you know we've talked about safety and we've talked about function and and those are all things you can kind of you know make modifications to your home over time or you know quicker if you want but with activity and stimulation that's like a 24-7 job isn't it? Um, I guess it's one of those things where I feel like it depends on your perspective. And I definitely remember a time when I was like, uh, what do I do when I was brand new to all of this and didn't have any ideas? And now it just feels really natural. So I, and what I love about that is that I know we can help people get, to, you know, our listeners get to the same point too, where they're like, oh yeah, okay, I got this. In a prior episode, we talked briefly about having a daily plan. And I think that's important that this plan includes or or has a focus on ways to keep your loved one involved and active. Do you agree that that plan's a good place to to start, maybe? Oh, yeah. When I'm talking about a, a plan for a daily plan, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, great. And that, that includes when we talk about keeping them active, and it's about activities of daily living as well, which in, could include helping out around the house or just or getting dressed, but it can also include uh, recreational things such as hobbies and having fun, right? Yeah, and I think that that's where there's a little bit of disconnect in our brain as care partners because you hear things like um, doing household chores and you're like, how's that fun? How's that? I don't get it. <laughs> like, Because we're thinking for ourselves. I mean, who among us really enjoys dusting or doing the dishes? Probably not anybody, but when we're talking about somebody who's living with dementia, that sense of purpose, which I know we talk about a lot on the show, um, but it's so crucial and it gives people a sense of purpose, a feeling that I belong in this family, I'm a contributor in this household, and all of that builds self-esteem. Plus, for us as care partners who are busy all the time, how delightful is that when you can get your loved one, um, you know, washing dishes and and vacuuming for you. That's great. It's a win-win-win. Absolutely. And 
I think there can also be a, a social element to it if if you can do it together. Yeah. And, and that can be very beneficial. And um, that purpose is, like you mentioned, so important that I think care partners probably oftentimes try to, they want to do everything themselves because they know they can get it done quicker and get it done right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a funny thing when we look at how many responsibilities we have as care partners and trying to make sure that this person we love is safe and reasonably happy and then we get caught up on kind of gooberish little details like well that wasn't the way I'd do it that's where we got to go to the who cares philosophy of dementia care which is you know some stuff we just got to let go because it wasn't done perfectly eh, shrug your shoulders say who cares it's right, okay right reset our expectations right you betcha. I'm sure that's a really hard thing to slow down and do at times for a lot of our care partners, but it's definitely something to th- to acknowledge and, and to and work at doing. It really is because I promise everybody listening, if you do this one thing, you will be happier. I promise you, you will be happier. So, you know, doing household chores or helping shop or pay bills, you know, you've talked before how many steps there are to do laundry, for instance, and that your steps are different than my steps. Can you kind of go back over your strategy or suggestions to our care partners and our our listeners on how to make that a, a successful activity for their loved one? Sure. So just like with us, right, and any task that we're doing, let's say if we were at our job and we have a boss, in order for us to be successful, there needs to be clear expectations. And if it's something that we haven't done before or we don't do regularly or we've forgotten how to do, then we need somebody to show us. And so it's the same for our loved ones. So for example, let's say you go ahead and do a load of laundry and now the towels are coming out of the dryer. Okay, scoop up that basket, bring it to your loved one and say, I need help with this. And so you start folding towels together. You show them like, you know, this is how we do it. And then if it looks like they got it, then you can, you know, move away and maybe do something else. But don't have an expectation of I'm going to have my person fold a load of towels and that's going to give me an opportunity to go clean out the garage, right? It's not going to take somebody that long and they're going to still need, you know, some supervision, assistance and support. But if we show people what we're talking about, we're often way more successful because those visual cues can be so helpful. Interesting. And and one thing I'm thinking about when you're talking about doing laundry, my um my wife showed me how she folds her laundry and I fold my laundry differently. And in the beginning of our relationship, I'd get hung up on the fact that she didn't fold her shirts right, but she really folds them better. So I had to reset <laughs> had to reset my expectations, but I don't know why I had to tell that. But I, I guess because I, I- I love it because stories like that are what make me feel so good about um, not finding my husband until later in life. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess my point is that we all do, it's back to the expectations. We all do things differently and that doesn't make one way the absolute right way. And, and you know, like you said, we, we want to, what's really important here. Right. And just something that's so useful to keep in mind is Remember, you can be right or you can be happy. Correct. And I always get blowback on that. There are always families that go, you know what makes me happy, Christy? Being right. Right. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) There's a shortcut to this. And sometimes it's just, I mean, really, if we look at it in the big picture and we're talking about, here's this person that we've been married to for 50, 60 years or a parent that we adore. Is it? You know, do we really want to spend our time talking about he didn't load the dishwasher the right way or trying to correct that? Or would we rather spend our time like, tell me again about the night I was born. I love when you tell that story, Dad. You know, that type of thing. So we we get the choice in how we want to spend those moments together. 
And I went all philosophical on you, Mike. Sorry, we're actually talking concrete, practical tips for helping. For, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's all good. So what I what I like about the um, so we talk about you know doing the laundry, and you, you I like how you're saying show you know demonstrate how to do it. But as as the disease progresses, it, there's that direction to help break task into smaller, simpler steps, right? There's the, I, I like the analogy of how when a, we're raising a child and in, in the beginning, we don't let them do everything. We let them do little pieces and we build them up to the bigger, you know, eventually they set the entire kitchen table, for instance. But with our loved one with dementia, who used to be the gourmet cook or something, maybe now we're backing off steps each, you know, as their abilities change and trying to keep, th trying to ma maximize successful outcomes, I'll say. So rather than having them set the entire kitchen table, for instance, maybe we have them get the plates out for us and then we help set it together or something. Do you agree with that approach? Right. So what we call it, you know, in a professional setting is task segmentation, meaning anything with more than three steps, we're going to break down. And it would depend on where your person is in the process, too, of course. But that's just a good rule of thumb. Uh, also, because like you said, set the table. I know what that means. You know what that means. But it can get a little sketchy for somebody who's a little further into the process. Whereas uh, put the forks next to the plates or put the plates on the table, that can that's pretty specific and concrete. When you say put the plates on the table, you may end up with a stack of four plates on top of each other on the table. That's okay because then you just break it into the next thing put one plate in front of or on each placemat. Oh, okay. Put a fork next to each plate. And that's task segmentation in action. And again, our, our point is always we want people to be successful, right? And that's a great way to help them do that. That's great because if, if we don't do the task segmentation and help them be successful, then we're setting up for for failures or frustrations or confusions which lead to negative communication aka behaviors um right so we want to always foster that successful those successful outcomes for sure for for both of us because we're we're involved in this too right so i we want to have a great day as much as our loved one does right and and i like to t use the term i always say silently assist people so rather than pointing out that they're not doing something right lead by example like kind of like you said with the laundry but rather than say why didn't you put the plates where you're supposed to then just start doing it and ask them to follow you know in along with you right Oh, yeah. I mean, there's really no need to um, point out something like, oh, you did it wrong. Why would you do that? And, and you know, I, I don't say that to be snarky, but I have had situations where I've worked with families and I have literally asked that question, you know, uh, where they tell me they I always get in an argument with my person. OK, well, tell me more about that. And why does that work? Well, because he doesn't do this right or he doesn't do that right. And I say, how is that making life better for him or for you when you get in when you get sucked into that and sometimes it's just a matter of care partners are obviously under an enormous amount of stress some manage it uh, more successfully than others and sometimes people just have patterns that they're not aware of until they realize it's not working, but they can't put their finger on why it's not working. And then somebody like me gets involved and says, okay, well, let's look at this one little point that you're kind of glossing over, you're not really seeing, and let's see if that can make a difference. And you know what? So often it does. Because if we change from you're not doing it right or pointing out everything that isn't the way we want it to be, if we go from that mindset to a mindset of today, I'm going to create as many gratuitous good feelings as I possibly can. So every time I would normally say you didn't do that right, or no, do it this way, I'm instead going to say, 
I love you. Or I'm so happy we're together or something positive. Just try that for a day. I challenge everybody listening, try that for a day and see how much different you feel at the end of that day and how much different the day was. Yeah, I would definitely feel much better myself. I I know that I would be one of the people, I would definitely fall into the trap though of being in such a rush, trying to get things done that I would find myself saying, why didn't you do that right? And then I would feel guilty and then I would... I would, <laughs> I, I would much rather feel the opposite and feel happy and, and happy with myself and how I handled it. So definitely. Yeah, we all would. And you know what? When humans are involved, mistakes will be made. But dementia gives us so many opportunities to practice. Practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's what we have to do with every new pattern or new behavior that we want to do, right? We have to practice it. Right. Practice, so, practice. Yeah. That's a good point. Practice. And and remember that we're practicing because we're not perfect and we're trying to become better at what we're doing. So that makes sense. Exactly. So with activities, you know, we have we have we want to fulfill we have physical needs and we have emotional needs. We we kind of just talked on the emotional need a little bit of, you know, having purpose and being involved. There's also physical needs like we need to move our body we need to be active we need to get yes. oxygen flowing through our our veins and our body and and help us stay healthy and that's where we start to you know sure we can get some of that with housework but we we need to get that into our like our um exercise doing some exercise or some dancing or what you have any tips for being helping our loved ones be physically active yeah, so, you know, walking is always a really good one. So, you know, go for a walk around the block if they want to walk more. And, you know, and this is literally where you can stop and smell the roses. You do this in good weather. In some places, of course, it gets very hot early in the day. So we'd want to do it earlier in the day or later in the evening or go to the mall and walk around there. Or, you know, there are people that use a wheelchair. They can still move, right? So there are chair exercises. Go to YouTube, look up chair exercises. You'll see videos uh, for that. Just tossing a ball back and forth in the backyard is fun. Uh, if you have a dog, uh, have your person throw the ball to the dog. You know, that's, again, when we're looking at what's fun, the possibilities um, get to be kind of endless. And then there's also, uh, you know, yoga is great for people living with dementia. So you, and there's chair yoga. Um, so there's different types of yoga programs uh, for seniors, for people who aren't as agile and, and need some adaptations. The possibilities are, are pretty endless. Interesting. I had not heard of yoga and dementia. That's a, that's a, that intrigues me a lot. I need to yeah. do, I want to do yoga myself, but I haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I actually have a post on my website, so uh, I can send you the link. Maybe we can put that in the show notes. All right. That sounds great. So I love how you, you mentioned also, you know, when you're out and about, you can, you can stop and smell the roses because I think sensory stimulation is a very important part of, you know, being active and that stimulation that I talk about because there's, there's smells, sounds, there's tactile, there's taste, and all of that can be incorporated into an active day and i think it's so healthy and needed by our brain to to process those different you know that sensory stimulation yeah and again the whole point is like we're aiming for a great day right exactly we, we have this person who has a life limiting condition we know that today is the best day because it's a progressive condition. So why would we want to do anything other than have a great day every day? Wait, like, this is literally the time to stop and smell the roses with your person. Ring every last ounce of enjoyment out of the day that you possibly can. While you're saying that, it made me think about doing things together while they can still do things like if you're if there's bucket list items that people wanted to do 
try to do some of those if it's if it's reasonable if um take pictures together right do get out and take pictures and because you'll cherish those pictures or videos are so easy these days oh videos i always tell people like when you're together pull out your phone and don't just take pictures i uh, turn on that video function you have no idea what i mean it's a price above rubies for the sound of your loved one's voice after you it's not there anymore that's a really big deal yeah, that's uh, that's great advice. I hadn't really thought about it like that, but and and I know some care partners who've created photo albums together. So there's that those that's activities. That's so fun, yeah. And even some that have written memoirs together while they, you know, while everyone still can. Those are treasures that you'll have forever and look back on. Yes, those are so fun too because I I did that as a project years ago. Um, when I was working in a community and the things that the stories that people had, the adventures they'd had in life, things that maybe they hadn't even told their family about before. Um, that's just a lot of fun and a great bonding uh, exercise. So Christy, what about hobbies? I, I feel like hobbies are in our DNA. I say hobbies choose us. We don't choose hobbies. Um, cause I've tried to, <laughs> I've tried to choose, I've tried to change my interests and hobbies and I always, always fall back to like woodworking and animals, for instance. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what, you have any tips or suggestions about how to keep a loved one involved with any hobbies they had in the past or currently? Well, I always say, and, and I actually, I differ on this because I think that hobbies can change as we age. Because for example, when I was nine years old, um, I was all about roller skating and I'm really not now. Sure. So <laughs> things can, our interests can change over time. But I think one of the mistakes that we can fall into as care partners is when we're thinking, uh, for example, woodworking, great example, you know, oh, Mike always loved to do woodworking, but obviously you can't have a circular saw now. That would be dangerous. So we just need to, you know, sell all his tools and no, no, no. <laughs> Instead, let's look at adapting. So with woodworking, for example, uh, somebody with dementia can still sand. Uh, they can supervise somebody who's making the cuts for them, right? There's... Um, uh, putting like you can even get kits like at Michael's of like birdhouses that you put together and the woods already all pre-cut and then you uh, actually that's a project you put it together then you can paint it you can get the bird seed you can figure out a place to hang it around the house you can then watch the birds come you can take pictures of the birds I mean so there are just so many ways that you can make sure that your person is still involved in something that they've had a passion for for years and even if they're not able to engage in it in the same way that they used to yeah i was thinking about that as you were talking and you know in, in my hobby of woodworking goes beyond you know just the wood piece of it it's also the the screws and the bolts and the nuts and and i often find my not often but i find myself sorting my hardware in the garage so that could be something that a per, your loved one can help with too is sorting things i seem to like sorting <laughs> yeah that that is a great one um and for people who are a little bit more um advanced in the process uh for example i had uh, a resident years ago who had been an accountant and she was at a part in the process where she would um, make repetitive statements nonstop. i mean like nonstop. the only time she wasn't talking is if she was sleeping and what we found was that when we got her involved in uh, some type of function that required either deep concentration or eye-hand coordination, she was literally speechless. It's not that we didn't want her to talk, but like she could not do both at the same time. And she was so relaxed and happy when she was involved in something, obviously, because who wants to you know, be stuck in that repetitive groove? But as a former accountant, we had sorting sticks, uh, different colors. Okay. Again, you can get those at Michael's. And they're like popsicle sticks, right? But and they're like 400 to a bag and all these different colors. And would ask her to sort them by color and then tally how much were in each pile. She oh, loved it. Loved awesome. it. 
And that would, that would easily go for hour, hour and a half. And she was fascinated. She was concentrating. She had a sense of purpose. This connected in her brain with something that she w- had been passionate about. So, yeah, lots of stuff you can do. That's a, that's a great example. And what comes to mind there is that why it's so important, I believe, that care partners f- complete a person-centered profile and enlist everything out that they can about their loved one's likes, dislikes, because then when they, you hand that over to someone like Christy, she's like, oh, she used to be an accountant. You know, maybe there's a, you can, you know, help her out. That'll trigger you to come up with solutions like that. So that's a great, I love that story. You, yeah. um, you mentioned, you know, and you're right, hobbies can change. And I think one thing, place we really see that with people with dementia is art. People who yes. didn't used to engage in art at all probably kind of like myself now all of a sudden have be are becoming artists and painters and and really taking it on and having a lot of fun with that have you witnessed that yourself well sure so here in portland uh we annually have the uh, alzheimer's association memories in the making art auction and that's a program where um, it's in uh, care communities and some senior communities or like senior center people with Alzheimer's start uh, creating uh, paintings and it is amazing. And that's kind of taking advantage of that, um, that loss of inhibition and some more difficulty that people have with expressing their thoughts verbally. And all of a sudden, whoo, I mean, they're creating this beautiful art. In fact, I have a picture um, that I bought at the art auction. It was a couple of years ago of a house that this man uh, painted, his childhood home. And I just swooned when I saw it. So that's something that people who never really even showed any interest in in art, all of a sudden uh, you go, wow, I didn't know that was inside you. That is such a great way to express emotion and creativity and you know, thoughts and and feelings. And it's so engaging too. People really seem to enjoy it. And I think that shows why you shouldn't make assumptions that your loved one won't do something. You have to at least give it a shot and give it, you know, try it. And yeah, and and maybe it didn't work today, but maybe it'll work next week. Right. Or, you know, so try it again. And then just on a side note, I want to mention that I also attended one of these memories in the making kind of auctions locally here and it's one of the very first things that inspired me to help the alzheimer's community and i too have a picture on my wall that i got and uh, (laughs) and i always tell people i think it's better than a a picasso i just think it's right i'm not a big picasso fan but um (laughs) (laughs) i'm not i'm not either okay so full disclosure (laughs) i uh, i'm i'm much more proud of this picture than i would be with the picasso so, Christy, um, we are already coming up near the end, but I think other w- things that our care partners should think about when keeping a loved one active and is the s- spiritual side of it and the reminiscent side of it. I think both are great opportunities to bring fulfillment to someone's heart, if you will. So the spiritual side, a lot of people you know, still like to have that church impact, and the, but they can't necessarily get to church. So I recommend people maybe have a Bible nearby if that's appropriate or play church on Sundays or record it and play it anytime during the week. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, I have some mixed thoughts about this. Okay. Um, So one thing is uh, a lot of times that we as adult children don't necessarily see the value in it because maybe we grew up in a church that we chafed against. So we forget that it is important like you said. Um, And sometimes people uh, have a religious tradition that is very hellfire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if that's what you believe, okay, that's what you believe. I'm telling you as a dementia expert, please do not do that to your person. Stay with the positive, stay with the singing Yes, Jesus loves me. Right. Uh, yeah. If you want to record a program off the TV, Joel Osteen is a very good choice. It's always very positive. It's uplifting. 
and he smiles a lot. <laughs> and and people living with dementia love that. That energy, that reading that, those facial expressions, that energy, that's a very, very good choice. Another thing is um, just like the, every market in, in the USA, I'm sure, has a praise station on the dial or go to iHeartRadio.com and find one where it's positive, uplifting music or um, go to the library and one of those uh, Time Life, remember when they used to do the CDs right. <laughs> um, of, you know, gospel favorites or hymns from our youth or something like that where it would be familiar music is uh, a great way to honor somebody's spiritual needs. And, you know, a lot of times people just like it um, if you pray with them. And it doesn't have to be a long, elaborate thing. It can just be like, I'm going to hold your hand and, you know, we're going to say thank you for our food. Or, um, you know, I know that God is with you right now. Something like that. It doesn't have to be a big deal right? And for us. We, we shouldn't make it a big deal about us. Let me put it that way. Exactly. And, and I want to mention, I like that you mentioned Joel because I'm not – really the church going tight because of some of my past experiences, but J Joel is somebody I, I would listen to, but there are other guys on, and gals on TV that I would just be so put off by. So um, just yeah. definitely watch your loved one's demeanor and don't force things upon them. And, and, and yes. when we touched on music, I just want to hit it real quick. We touched on music there a little bit. And music, of course, everyone thinks of, I think. And it just covers so many things because you can, it creates memories. It brings up memories. It's an opportunity to dance together and have that social contact, that touch. It's exercise if you want. And you can, you can bring in instruments. If maybe it's a simple tambourine or maybe your loved one likes to put their fingers on the ivory of a piano. Um, but music's always something to not, to not overlook. Absolutely. I have a client right now who um, has a piano in her home and is pretty shy about it, though. Like, oh, I'm not very good. And, oh, I, I, I'm not really a musician. And I said, would you please play for me? I would just, I would really love it. I really admire people who can play piano because I never... Uh, could master that or, or learn that and she did and it was just a a few bars but it was the smile on her face was just mm. she she could have lit up a city block right so it just brings so much joy and it doesn't have to be sometimes we make things a little bit more complicated than they have to because we don't realize how easy it can be to just, you know, just a few bars can make a big difference. Absolutely. Well, Christy, uh, thanks again for another awesome episode. I really love how you bring your expertise to the show and help our care partners be successful at home. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love getting to talk about this stuff. <laughs> All righty. Well, bye now. Bye. This concludes our conversation with Christy Turner, the Dementia Sherpa, right here on the Alzheimer's Podcast, your number one source for practical tips and insights. Adapting your home for dementia and making it dementia-friendly is a lot of work, but by taking incremental steps each day, you can keep your loved one home longer, safer, and happier. Be sure to check out the episode page at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode 50, where you will find links to resources and the Adapting Your Home for Dementia course that will help you be successful. Thank you, and I look forward to sharing more with you next week when Christy and I discuss the final element of the dementia-friendly home, reducing triggers which may result in negative outcomes. Bye now. You've been listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness. For more information and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit togetherness.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>